First one mentioned, I'm going through order. I would find one and I'd make this list. And I'd find one and I'd make the list. A revived spirit is one of the first mentions of a type of spirit we can have. I want a revived spirit, right? I want to put the life back into myself, into this church, into this community, and uh, Lord willing, into you. A revived spirit. We have that power through the Holy Spirit. Uh, a spirit of wisdom. A willing spirit. They're willing to do something, right? A good spirit. A spirit of understanding. Now here's one. A contrite spirit. You know what a contrite spirit is? That's somebody that's meek, lowly, and humble of a broken heart willing to confess, I need your help, God. A contrite spirit. Contrition, it's called. A right spirit, like righteousness. A holy spirit. I love this one. A free spirit. Now, today people use it like a real liberal sense. Oh, they're a real free-spirited person. It's like, yeah, well, tell them to put their clothes back on and get a job, right? No, but I mean, that's actually a godly concept that he's given us of a free spirit that when he comes and redeems you and he makes you free, once you're made free, you can't be unmade and you're permanently free, right? God wants to give you a free spirit, freeness in Christ. Let's see, a broken spirit. Now, sometimes when it comes to dealing with God, having a broken spirit is important. And let me give you some marital advice. Sometimes when it comes to dealing with your spouse, also having a broken spirit is important too. Not preferring yourself, preferring them. A steadfast spirit, steady, not quitting, right? A faithful spirit, a humble spirit, an excellent spirit. I love that one. The spirit of excellence. It was said of Daniel, and it was said of Joseph, that they excelled them all, just like the Proverbs 31. She excelled them all. I want a spirit of excellence, not to where I can say, I did it better, no, 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 but to say that by me submitting to God and humbling myself and being ready and willing to work and doing whatever I need to do, that I was excelling every, everything I put my hand to that God would bless. That's what we need. I want that spirit of excellence that it would be said when you go into the workplace, people just say, I don't know what it is about that guy, but he's just, he's doing a good job. And when I got to pick my team for this special project, I want that guy because I know he's going to lift up the team and he's going to work hard and he's going to do the best he can. I mean, that's the kind of spirit of excellence we ought to have. It said of Daniel, it said they were 10 times better. Would it be said of you to your coworker that you're 10 times better? We have that potential through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's a good one. A patient spirit. Here's a controversial one, although it's biblical. A spirit of judgment. That's a prophecy of Jesus. And we're called to judge. People say, well, we don't judge anybody. It's like well, you judge whether the light is green or red. You judge whether they're a man or a woman. You judge what's right and wrong. You judge when they do it to you. Oh, I can't believe they did that to me. That was wrong. But we won't judge in the world. We need to be known as judging righteously even when we're condemning ourselves. You know what? I was wrong. What I said was an exaggeration. I have sinned. Please forgive me. Be willing to judge at all times. Judge righteously. Here's an interesting one. Not that it, where it mentions that spirit of judgment, it also mentions a spirit of burning. That's godly burning. Fired up! Alive! Not dead! A spirit of counsel. You know, there are some men, if you came to me with a big problem, and you said, I need, who can I talk to? I say, I've got a couple guys, let me give you their name. They have a real spirit of counsel. They're going to be wise at whatever advice they give you. Uh, a new spirit is a godly thing. A spirit of grace. A poor spirit. Now, Jesus used that of being kind of brokenhearted. Again, humble before God. God said, I can use that person because they, they're not trying to run the show, but they're willing to do whatever I need done. A willing spirit, a ready spirit, a spirit of power. It talks about rejoicing in your spirit. That's something we ought to do. We ought to give God joy. Have a spirit of joy. A strong spirit. A stirred spirit. You ever felt stirred in your spirit? I've had moments like that. It just gets stirred up and fired up, right? A fervent spirit. Now, usually that's in reference to prayer and trying to help somebody. Uh, purposed in your spirit. That's like dialed in and focused. I have something to do. I'm purposed in my spirit. 
in the spirit of holiness, newness of spirit, spiritually minded, meekness, a discerning spirit, a zealous spirit. It talks about a quickening spirit. That quick is like quick and dead. That means alive and dead, okay? A refreshed spirit. Boy, that sounds good. The spirit of faith. How about the spirit of revelation? Being able to reveal the mysteries of God. How about the spirit of power? Remember where we heard fear. We've not been given the spirit of fear. Oh, no, no. But the spirit of power and the spirit of love and the spirit of a sound mind. Those are things God wants for you. We ought to have a ministering spirit. It says we ought to have a meek and a quiet spirit. A spirit of glory. Spirit of truth. And here's the last. Spirit of prophecy. Now that's interesting because it's referring to Jesus. If we're, how do we know we're your follower of Jesus? Because we're prophesying, we're preaching, we're telling you what He said. I give you that list and there was a couple favorite opposites I had. The haughty versus humble. I thought that was neat. Or patient versus proud. Or truth versus error. You're in, first, in, in Proverbs 15. Let's look at a couple verses real quick. Proverbs chapter 15, find verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Now, you have a choice to have a merry heart. It's your choice. Yeah, but you don't know what's going on in my life. It doesn't matter. I know who your Savior is. And if you have the Holy Spirit, capital S, living inside of you, don't quench that spirit. Instead, sanctify your little s spirit and get it all figured out. And just realize who you are, where you're at, and it's a lot better than it could be. Sometimes people say, hey, how's it going? I'll say, uh, it could be better, it could be worse, so I'll take what I've got. Now, that's Brother Chad touched on that this morning. Contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain, right? What a great concept. If you would, go to Proverbs 16. So Proverbs 15, 13, he said, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. That's your face, your appearance, your attitude, your spirit. By, by a sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Don't let your heart get over much sorrow because it will drag others down. Go to the end of chapter 16. Find verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. That means you're in control of yourself. You're taking control of your body. You're not letting your spirit be uh, tossed to and fro, right? Uh, every whim, everything that comes along, oh, he's flying off the handle again. Why? Well, he can't control his spirit. Think about what this is saying. If you're slow to anger, that's better than a strong man. Oh, we can't move it. We need three guys. I got it. Rah! But then you can't control your spirit. You fly off at the handle and you say things that are hurtful to other people. Not impressed. Go to the next chapter, chapter 17. Proverbs 17. And again, start your day in the book of Proverbs. You're seeing a little bit why I hear, because line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's like little bread comes, crumbs on every topic as you go. God wants to help you to be humble and not proud. God wants to give you a cheerful and a healthy spirit. And He, he just puts these things through. Uh, Proverbs 17, find verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. I learned this when I was a child. I learned it, and, you know, a merry heart. There's even a little song for it. Who knows this? Who's, who's familiar with this proverb? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. I'm here to tell you something. Before you go to the doctor, it may do you well to check your spirit. Do you realize that you have power? If there's power of death and life in the tongue, it tells us in Proverbs 18, I have power over death in my body, or, oh, it's all going to be miserable. It's going to be the worst thing ever. It's like, well, you're proclaiming these promises. Why would you say that? Why don't you say, hey, you know what? We have opposition, and I catch myself, and I say, wait a minute. God forbid, right? And then I turn it around, and I say, Lord willing, it'll all work out just fine. Well, they're against us, but you know what? If God be for us, who can be against us? Why, why should I worry? Now, now, think about this. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. If you'll change your spirit and change your heart and change your attitude, it will make you healthy. And I don't care if the FDA doesn't like that statement. 
And they, oh, you're giving out health advice. Uh, the drugging our food administration, I call them. Right? <laughs> I don't care if they don't like this. I don't care if your local doctor doesn't like that. I'm here to tell you if you change your heart, you change your frequency, you change your energy. Well, let's use Bible words. You change your spirit. And it'll give you health. You know why some people live to a long, old, sweet age? Because they're happy. They're content with what God's given them. They have a good spirit. You know why some people die early? Because they're mad, they're bitter, they're angry, and they'll let you know it. And it's like, man, it's not a good way to be. Like Nabal, his heart turned to stone. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. That's the opposite. He's literally saying the wrong spirit will destroy your body. That's a fact. The wrong attitude will destroy your health. That's a fact. This is a Bible fact. Look at verse 27. He that hath knowledge spareth his words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit. Boy, isn't that where we want to be? Go to the next chapter, chapter 18. Find verse number 14. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. But a wounded spirit who can bear. Do you know what that means? Well, now the last verse, he told us that uh, it's good like a medicine. Now he's saying, okay, so you have an infirmity. You have a sickness in the flesh. But you know what? When you change your spirit, he says, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. If you have a good attitude, even in a bad time, it will help you get through it and get healthy and get over it. Amen. Again, a medical fact that comes out of the Bible. If your spirit's good, I'm stuck in the hospital. I can't move. What are you going to do? I don't know. I might die. Well, you might. You say, I don't know, but God's good, and I don't even deserve to be alive right now. And with His power and His might and His blessing, I'm going to get up and get out of here one day. Well, then you might. We put it on the Lord. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? You guys ever, I mean, what do they call him? A, a, what was that cartoon? A, a Eeyore? Yeah. Oh, me. Oh, bother. <laughs> There's all, or what was the, the, the peanuts? What was there like a cloud of Linus? Was that it? There's always trouble around. It's just always negative. And it's like, maybe it's you. Don't be a negative Nancy. But I don't think we have any Nancys in here, so I'm sorry. All right? <laughs> a bad attitude Billy. How about that? No, no Billies? Okay, we're good. All right. Now think about it. If you're always going around professing how terrible it is, well, you're going to manifest that in your life. This is just a physical truth of the power of your spirit. But now wait, now wait. If you're saved, God's given you of His Holy Spirit to live inside of you and to take you in another direction. If you would, go to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. When you get there, go to verse 28 at the end of the chapter. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. The city that's broken down and without walls, there's no defense. There's no safety. Hey, there's no peace. If you can't control your own spirit, you're not going to have peace in your life. That's a fact. Now, the Holy Spirit. Go to John 14. Go to John 14. I tell you, we all have our own spirit per se. It was interesting that God took the spirit that was upon Moses and He put it on the 70 elders and immediately they began to prophesy. Or you look at Elijah who had such a powerful spirit for God and Elisha said, I want a double portion of what he has. And God gave it to him. He did twice as many miracles. And then John the Baptist came in the same power and spirit of Elijah and he did many miracles also. It's okay for you to look at somebody and say, well that man, he just has a spirit of Barnabas. I, you know, I, I want to be more like that and Instead of being like Peter, who's all over the place, right? Or whatever it is, you say, boy, I want to be more like, a, I want to see godly characteristics in my life, and I see a good spirit in somebody, I want to copy that, but be careful because, what's it say? Not to make friendship with an angry man, because you'll learn his ways, and then you become an angry man, and you've got an angry spirit, and everything you touch, you curse. You don't want that in your life, and it's your choice. This is so important. John 14, I just want you to know, you have power over your own spirit, over your own attitude. God gives us of the Holy Spirit to begin to work inside of our life and change our own little s spirit. Don't be like the disciples, but they didn't know what manner of spirit they were. Hey, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. 
You can choose to glorify God in your attitude, your everyday attitude. John 14, here's how we do it. Here's the solution, and I'll be quick. John 14, look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, if, if somebody said, if they used one word to describe you, and they said, well, they're just such a comforter. She is just such a comforter. Do you see how that's a characteristic of a Holy Spirit? If they said contentious, uh-oh, that's not the Holy Spirit, right? That's the evil spirit or your own spirit. Verse 17, even, here's another name for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. This is where, we, this is where the doctrine comes from of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are kings and priests unto God. Once you're saved, you have a special purpose, and He gives you everything you need. He's not going to send you to war without your armor or your weapons, if you will. The Holy Spirit moves in, and He's there to help you. Go to the next chapter. Go to John 15. He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That's a promise from Jesus about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth. John 15, find verse 26. Very similar concept. John 15, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit comes not to speak of Himself, but to speak of Jesus. He comes in the name of Jesus once you believe on Jesus. And then once He moves in, there's two things He does. Number one is He teaches you all things. When it means all things. Now, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not a scholar of Greek and Hebrew, but uh, by a show of hands, how many people think when the Bible says all, it means all? Oh, yeah. Amen! Amen! Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that if you're working on something, you're a mechanic or a technician, or you're at work trying to figure out some paperwork, or you've got some problem in, your, in life, and you pray to God for His glory and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in His name, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden He can open up your understanding? I could tell you of times working as a network technician where I'm working on a mess of wires. If you've ever seen a data closet, an IT closet where 10 different guys have been there and not a one of them cared about the place, it's a spaghetti mess. And you're like, oh no, I've got to figure all this out. What am I going to do? Pray. Ask God for help. Trust that the Holy Spirit will lead me. I can't tell you how, and I, well, I mean, uh, oh wait, what's this? Wait, hold on. And just like, I mean, the Lord works in so many unique ways. It's awesome. I have that kind of faith about God working, and if you have that same faith, it'll happen. And you're going to get home, and you're going to be all excited, and you're going to tell your spouse, you're never going to believe what God did today. And it's like, you found a wire. What's the big deal? And you're like, you don't understand. Like, this was a huge, this was monumental. This was mountain moving in my life, okay? I just needed to figure something out, right? But, you know, that's okay. You tell your friend about it. You tell your, you know, well, that wasn't that big. Oh, it was big to me. It was big to me. Chapter 16. Uh, uh, John 16, oh, oh, also, I'm sorry, in, in verse 26, he said, the second thing, he says, I'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He's talking about the scriptures. If you'll get this in your ears and in your heart, it's one thing to come here on a Sunday morning and let me quote some verses to you and read some verses. That gets it in your heart. But I'm pretty sure you eat more than once a week. Now, we have preaching three times a week. We have soul winning twice a week. Actually, four times a week now that we have family Sunday school, right? So, hey, man, like a biscuit, soak up as much of that as you can. Let it get in your heart and in your mind. It'll come out of your mouth. It'll change your life if you'll let it. But until you open this up and get the bread of life for yourself, like you eat every day, you read this before you get your coffee, do you read this before you eat your breakfast? You read this before you go to bed? If you will, then he says, I will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. When Jesus taught us a lot of great things, it's all throughout the Bible. You know how many times a verse would come back to my memory that it's like, man, I haven't thought of that verse in years. Where did it come from? Well, the Lord working through the Holy Spirit. 
You say, I I'm not called to be a preacher, pastor. How can I do what you do? You don't, but God has you for a place and a purpose. And if you're not getting in here, getting in here, it'll never come out of here. But He can do it. Now, chapter 16, verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. Now that's an awesome promise. He's going to guide us. If you'll follow Him, He'll guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. I could tell you of times that I believe the Lord has given me a vision. And I say this carefully, because I've had people say, oh, I saw a vision, and let me tell you, and I'm like, whoa, getting a little weird, right? <laughs> Wait, buddy, we're not Pentecostals around here. We don't sit around and dream up stuff. But I've had times when the Lord has shown me things, and it came to pass in a way, in a sense. And it's like, you know, I, I think the Lord still communicates through us and through our spirit, and he, he talks to us through our own conscience, that still small voice. He works, and He shows us things to guide us if we're ready to follow Him. Now go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, and here's the simple solution on how to fix your attitude or how to sanctify your spirit. You say, Pastor, I want to get better with my spirit. Okay, it's right here. It's real simple. It's real short. You take it with you. You can write everything I'm about to give you on one three by five. There's such power in just a few words. I want you to understand this. So he tells us in verse 23 that we need to be sanctified body, soul, and spirit. Well, let's take a step back to verse 16. How can I fix my attitude? Well, verse 16 says, rejoice evermore. When it says ever, does that mean continually? Always? Rejoice evermore. We as Christians, we have a tendency to um, call on the Lord out of complaint when things are not going our way. Has anybody ever walked out in the morning and see one flat tire? Oh, man, I got a tire flat. Ever, has that ever happened to you? Has anybody ever walked out and had a window broken out and something stolen? Has anybody else ever walked out and it's like I left it unlocked, I forgot about it, and it's obvious somebody's dug through everything in my vehicle, and I don't know what's here or not. Ever happened to anybody? It's a bad day when you walk out and you're ready to go and the tire's flat, isn't it? Have you ever just rejoiced that all four tires are still filled with air? Just once. I mean, be honest. If, if you did, then you're a better Christian than I am, because I'm guilty of this. I've never walked out and just said, wow, praise the Lord, my tires are inflated, my windows are in, the, the truck cranks, nobody stole anything last night, nobody spray painted the house. I mean, what a wonderful day. Boy, I started like this, there's no telling where we're going. When he says rejoice evermore, we need to find reasons to thank God. What do we do instead? We find reasons to complain. It's just not going my way. Now listen, I think God can use disaster in our life to divert us and get closer to being His disciple and to help us grow in certain ways. But true spiritual growth, true spiritual growth is when we rejoice evermore. Uh, now, I, I, again, I, I'm not an English scholar either, but when I see rejoice, that almost says like joy again. Who's happy you're saved? Amen. All your sins are forgiven. When's the last time you took joy out of that again? Boy, God, I just want to go back and thank you again for saving some wretched person like me that makes tons of mistakes and you still love me and you still save me. What a good God we serve. Amen. Rejoice. We were dealing with this a few months ago, my wife and I. Our house, our kitchen, it's small, it's old, it's got these little issues. They're little issues, but sometimes they seem like really big issues. And I just had to stop and I said, no, wait a minute. We live in the ghetto. There's gunshots all the time, right? I mean, there's some weird people now that live down the block. Now they're building these low-income housing right down from us, and then and this is wrong, and that's wrong, and it's too hot, and there's ants, and there's roaches, and what are we going to do? You know, it's like, wait, stop, hold on. We've never had a problem. No one's ever beat down our door. No one's ever beat us up. My kids can ride their bikes out front easily. I mean, we have a roof over our head. Every month, the bill's gotten paid. Praise the Lord. I mean, we have a lot. We, we're, we should be very thankful. This has been a great little neighborhood, a, a little secret pocket in the midst of, some, of the ghetto. You know what I mean? And, and we were talking about this, how really how blessed we really are. How's it going? Well, it could be better. It could be worse. So I'll take what I got. 
Rejoice evermore. How can I fix my attitude? Find a reason to rejoice. You just don't understand my situation. I know, I know. Your job's terrible. Are you rejoicing you have a job? Now wait, wait, you go to this job and, and wait, they, they pay you? Do they pay you well? You got a lot to be thankful for. Rejoice evermore. Not complain all the time. Rejoice evermore. What else can I do? Verse 17, pray without ceasing. No, pray when you need something. Pray all the time. That doesn't mean, you know, you have to come down and have this special prayer meeting. Only pray on Wednesdays. We, we set aside time. We ought to. You ought to start your morning in prayer, even if it's just, I'm awake, my eyes aren't open yet, but you start that prayer. Hey, Lord, how you doing? How can I help you today? What can I do to serve you? You start that constant conversation with the Lord. Pray without ceasing. Now, here's the neat thing. If you really are working at praying without ceasing, you're going to run out of stuff to ask for, and you're going to start praying for others. Right? Praying for the salvation of others, and praying for the blessing of others, and praying, well, Lord, this person here, I know they need to get close to you. Help me to, give me the power to get them in church so they can get closer to you, or they can hear the preach, and they can get fired up and excited. Have you ever prayed to be used of God to get somebody else where they need to be? Pray without ceasing. That means without stopping. I tell you, they say in a conversation, your dialogue, that you can speak 200 words per minute. 200 words per minute. Now, if you've ever heard Brother Luke preach, he can do about 300, okay? <laughs> they say that your internal dialogue, what you say to yourself, is about 800 words per minute. As you think through things, as you're talking about things, and you get distracted about things, and you're on the next subject, 800 words per minute, and all I'm here to do is ask you, can you give a few of those to God? If you find yourself on a regular basis bringing it back to home base, hey, Lord, uh, yep, help me with this, and I got this problem. Oh, Lord, help me with that, and Lord, show me where to be used in this. Lord, please use me right now. It'll be a blessing to somebody else. If we'll keep bringing it back to Him, praying without ceasing, It'll really open us up to a lot. Verse 18, again, I want to hurry. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. Uh-oh, that goes back to what I said about the tires. In everything give thanks. You know what God's looking for, people He can really use in the ministry? Those that thank Him from the dungeon, from the prison, from the poorhouse, with an empty table. Those that are thankful and content with what they have. Those that are thankful on a bad day. Hey, anybody can say, praise the Lord, when the bank account's full. That's true. But when it's broke, hey, you know what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives, He takes away. This must be of Him. He's going to do something great. If He's putting us through this kind of stuff, he, we must have a great lesson we have to learn out of it. So let's not ruin our spirit and have a bad attitude because then we'll forget to catch the spiritual growth lesson. And once we learn that lesson, the Lord gets us through this, then I'll be able to help somebody else and teach them what God can do for them. Don't miss your learning opportunity when you're going through a bad day. It's for spiritual growth. Uh, he says, again, verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He wants you to be known as thankful people. You ought to be thankful. You ought to say thank you for everything. Yeah, but I owed it to you. That's okay. I'm still saying thank you. Be thankful. Not, well, I'm entitled. They owe it to me. They should give it to me because I'm somebody. No, no, no. Thank you. Very kind. Verse 19, we talked about it. Quench not the Spirit. So, when your little S spirit diminishes and the big S spirit begins to increase in your life, don't put that fire out. Let Him work through you. Let Him guide you and lead you into all truth. Be used of Him. It's your, it's your will. You get to choose. Verse 20, despise not prophesyings. Now, what's prophesyings? Preaching. preaching. Don't hate the preacher. Don't hate the preaching. Brother Chad talked about money this morning and being wise with your money. I know some of you are back there like, well, he can't tell me not to get my $5 coffee. <laughs> you know? Don't despise the prophesying. He's trying to teach you how to have a better, healthier life with your wealth. Have wisdom with your wealth. 
I talked about you men that run these, these orange lights or whatever they are. Don't hate me for bringing it up, you know. Despise not prophesying. You know what happens is the people out there, they have no joy. They have no peace. Because they're not in here getting the preaching. They're not in here getting the wisdom. We need more prophesying on your way to work. Get your audio Bible. It'll play it and read it to you. On your way to work, pull up some Bible preaching. All of our preaching is online for years. A lot of it, some of it's been taken down. Some of it by choice. Some of it by YouTube. Well, you can't say that. You're not allowed to say that. Shame on you. And it wasn't even anything hateful. It's just, okay, it's my opinion. Anyway, you're not allowed to think that there's more than one. That's male and female, God said. You hear that, Google? I know they're listening somewhere, right? <laughs> if you don't like it, delete it, right? But we need, we need to say the truth. If you don't like my preaching, I'll, I'll, I'll give you other preachers to listen to. Despise not prophesying. Despise not prophesying. You know, God wants us to hear preaching. Amen. Not the world's music. Right. Not foolishness. We need to grow through preaching. This is God's plan for the local church. Verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Right? We're told to try the spirits to see if they be of God. Well, you got to know uh, what he say in 1 Corinthians 14 that uh, the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. If you get up here and say something and it contradicts with this, well then you're wrong. Right? So prove all things. Find out. I mean, give them the benefit of the doubt, but when they contradict the Bible, you say, oh, stop. I got to stop right here. I'm off the bus. What you're saying goes against the Bible. Jordan Peterson, so or whoever, whatever scholar of the world, philosopher of the world, this is the authority. Prove it through this. He says in verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. It's interesting. This is one of the verses that the new liberal translations, the Catholic translations attack. But God's will for your life is that you would abstain from all appearance of evil. I had somebody tell me, well, I, I need your help, preacher. And we, we need something at the house. That kind of, okay, okay. And then uh, how many people you got at the house? Oh, we got a bunch. And Well, but they're all on drugs. And it's like, well, you're not supposed to be an enabler. You're supposed to uh, abstain from the appearance of evil. How did we get where we just continue to lower our standard and lower our standard? It's like, well, I know God says this and I live up to it on Sundays, but Monday morning, all bets are off. I can live however I want. Does that glorify the Lord? Don't you think that negativity will destroy your spirit? When you sin against your conscience and you go against the will of the Lord, it begins to break you down and lower you and weaken you. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't go to the bar. Don't go in there and just drink a Coke. Don't go to the bar. Don't hang out with those kind of people. Hey, they need Christ. Some of them have Christ and they're living like hell. They need to hear some preaching. Despise not the preaching, right? Because that's what it is. Oh, here comes the preacher. He's going to tell us not to say those words. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Don't say those words. That's prison language. You shouldn't talk like that. You shouldn't have that mentality. I don't want to hear that garbage. Don't talk about your filthy lifestyle. I don't want to hear it. You're destroying yourself, and I'm trying to warn you because God told us the truth. And you know what? There are many Christians that know the truth, and they sin willfully against it. And then God says, well, you've got a greater punishment coming. There is a sin unto death in this life. And the Christians that are saved, that are going to heaven, they start living like the world? Oh, God forbid. They're going to destroy their life. Abstain from all appearance of evil, verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. He can set you apart completely, body, soul, and spirit. Did you notice what it calls Him? You know, it's an interesting title for God here. He is the God of peace. Why don't I have peace in my life? Maybe it's because you haven't gotten verses 16 through 22 figured out yet. Why is everything up in the air? Well, your spirit's up in the air. Why? Because you haven't figured out verses 16 through 22. Rejoice. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Abstain from the appearance of evil. Very simple concept. You can write it on a 3 by 5 and take it with you. The application for you is different than me, but the, the truth is the same. And he says, the God of peace sanctify you wholly. You know, in Matthew, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, who knows it? The children of God. That's almost like saying you have God's last name. 
If you're a peacemaker, the God of peace, are you, are you a, of a peaceful spirit? Is your attitude a peaceful, peacemaking spirit? Are you honoring the Lord with your thoughts and your actions and your life? Are you faithful in your spirit? Are you humble? Are you excellent in your spirit? Are you searching for godliness? Are you spiritually minded? Are you, do you have a meek and a quiet spirit? Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He came into His creation and He served them. And He gave us an example. And then He left us the Holy Spirit to move in and teach us how to fix our attitude, how to change our attitude. We can change our little s spirit, but if you don't, if you say, I don't care, I'm going to do it my way, well, then you're letting that little s spirit boss around the big s spirit, and you're not going to like the fruit that grows in your garden when you do that. I want to encourage you to be willing to get in the Word this week. Go out of your way to get in the Bible more than you did last week. If you'll make that commitment in your heart right now, if you'll make the commitment saying, Lord, show me my attitude problems. Maybe I'm a little too snappy with my spouse. Maybe I'm a little too puffed up at work because I work better than some of the guys or whatever. Maybe, maybe it's in how I deal with my extended family. Or Lord, God forbid, maybe it's how I deal with you and my sin. If we'll get closer to the Lord and ask Him, say, Lord, let Your Spirit run my spirit so my spirit doesn't ruin my life. Let's have some spiritual victory this week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would help us to take heed to our spirit, to consider what attitude that we're of. Lord, I pray that You would help us to live up to Your name. Lord, I ask that as we go out and we start this awesome week right now, Lord, I pray that You would give us the energy and the zeal to speak the truth to others and to do it in love and compassion and not strife. Lord, I pray that You would help us to build up families and build up the lost. I pray that You would give us the power today, Lord, to represent You in this community. Lord, I ask You would help us to see someone saved. We ask all this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen.